Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk and try to sing at the same time. Um, uh, so uh, for those of you who, um, who were here yesterday, I'd like to welcome you back. Um, for those of you who, who were not here yesterday, um, Dan left off with a comment that he's going to explain much of what he didn't get to explain yesterday. So you'll hopefully get um, a partial recap. Um, I'm not going to go through and uh, give a, a, a more of an introduction from yesterday, but I just was reminded of a story, um, a personal story. I mean, I've known Dan for many, many years, but um, it was a story that was very telling because um, it happened when I was a, uh, a graduate student um, working. This is driving me nuts. Um, <laughs> I can't chew gum and walk at the same time, so I'm just. Uh, can I just do the volume? Well, okay, we'll deal with that. Okay. <sighs> um, when I was a graduate student, I was um, uh, working in, in Kenya uh, in, a, in a beautiful national park called uh, Amboseli, and I was working with a population of small uh, old world monkeys called vervet monkeys. Um, it was a site that was a uh, very, very famous site. Uh, it had been studied by Tom Strusaker in the 60s, and it was the first time that people had discovered that these monkeys seemed to have very, very different kinds of uh, alarm calls to the different predators in their environment. And then subsequently, inspired by Peter Marler's work, who's one of the sort of the granddaddies of ethology, the study of behavior, uh, Robert Seyfarth and Dorothy Cheney went there um, to conduct some really gorgeous and very important playback experiments um, suggesting that these animals may have something kind of like a word, um, that the sound for a leopard is kind of like a designation of there being a leopard and so forth. And so when I was in the field, um, Dan had been um, to visit the vervet monkeys and had made some very interesting comments and observations about the possible intentionality of the animals. They were trying to signal to others what they meant and what they were talking about and so forth. And I, um, as a first-year grad student, wrote to Dan and was asking him a bunch of questions about this. And I, at the same time, I also wrote to uh, Stephen Jay Gould um, and asked him a question. So the questions of Dan were questions about intentionality, and the question of Stephen Jay Gould was, um, why are there no green mammals? I mean, there are green everything else's, but why no green mammals? <laughs> Gould never replied to my letter. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Dan promptly did reply to my letter, and we had a very nice conversation about the role of intentionality. And I always thought it was very sort of, for me, it was very, very exciting to get um, uh, a response as a first year grad student from a distinguished philosopher and really begin to engage. And then um, the rest is history because we became good friends and colleagues ever since I arrived here. So, without further ado, um, let me turn to Dan to talk for today. My body has a mind of its own, so what does it need me for? Hopefully, we will all find out. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, does anybody know how to get this um, uh, thing at the bottom here off the screen? I guess it's not important. Let's see if, if this works, we're all set. But it doesn't. So let's just see what we've got here. Aha. Now I think it'll work. And it does. OK, first, a little review. And I have to clarify a few things that I said yesterday. Uh, am I getting a lot of echo or something here? OK, everybody's happy? OK. So yesterday, I started off by introducing you to Darwin's and Turing's strange inversions of reasoning, which were basically the amazing heretofore unimagined possibility that there could be competence without comprehension. Competence in the case of Darwin, uh, that this process of natural selection could be competent to create the whole biosphere without understanding a darn thing. All the brilliance of all of the life forms, all the design, without any, without any comprehension of any sort. And in the case of Turing, it was his strange inversion, very similar actually, was that you could uh, you didn't have to understand arithmetic to do arithmetic. You could be a computer without understanding arithmetic. You didn't have, and have to have any comprehension at all in order to do perfect arithmetic. So the picture I was trying to get across to you was that before Turing, we have this really general picture across, I think, everything, that competence flows from understanding. That's what we teach in our schools. We teach people to understand so that they can use that understanding to make them competent. 
as if understanding were this sort of wonderful property from which competence flows, Turing really inverted that and said, no, no, uh, uh, understanding is constituted out of many competences, which are not themselves fully understanding. And so that you can build up in a sort of Darwinian fashion from incompetent, from incompetent and incomprehending simple little modules, which could do a little arithmetic, and you could build all the way up to uh, uh, genuine comprehension uh, by simply adding competence and more competence and more competence. And in the very adding of that competence, you would be adding comprehension. Well, a lot of people react to this, and one of the questioners yesterday did. Well, that's just merely behavioral understanding. And, and we had, we had an, uh, uh, an example of this, um, the wolves that care so competently for their young. Uh, uh, Stu, uh, uh, Stu Kaufman had said, they show deep understanding. I said, no, no, not really deep understanding. They show deep competence to raise their young. It's a behavioral competence. It's not clear they understand what they're doing at all beyond the fact that they're very competent. And uh, uh, some people objected that, but wait a minute, what kind of understanding is this which is just behavioral? Well, well, well is there another kind of, comp of understanding? <clears throat> to which the answer came back, yes, there is. There's conscious understanding. And this, of course, is what, say, John Searle has always insisted upon. Uh, understanding is, is uh, necessarily tied to consciousness. Well, <clears throat> here's my claim, my shocking claim, that conscious understanding, whatever you're going to mean by that, it too has to be composed of unconscious, semi-comprehending, but competent agencies. Whatever conscious understanding is, it, it's just another mental phenomenon, and it has to be composed out of the raw materials we've got, and this is all we've got, if we're going to be naturalists, if we're going to be materialists. Um, some people want to say, well, I just can't imagine how that could be true. I don't see how, how uh, I can't conceive of how consciousness, consciousness, could be composed out of computations, however competent. Well, to which my answer is try harder. I'm, I'm dead serious about this. I want to remind you that, well, I'll get to that. Let's see. Uh, so I'm just having a little dialogue here. Uh, but behavioral understanding is not real understanding. Well, if it can build a Gaudi's church and Turing's computer, it's real enough for me. Those were two no, behavioral competence examples from yesterday. And I said, these are really special. This is, a kind of, this is a kind of mind that's never existed on the planet before that could make Gaudi's church or that could uh, make Turing's computer. This is not like the artifacts of any other creature. And it takes a special sort of mind. And I would say it takes a conscious mind. If you want to call that merely behavioral understanding, fair enough. But then it's not clear what the other kind of understanding would be good for. So now we get to consciousness. And my favorite picture of consciousness. This is a Stahl Steinberg New Yorker cover from back in the 60s. And it's my favorite thought balloon because it's so detailed. And uh, you see this fellow looking at the painting by Brock, and he identifies it. So he says, you know, there's a uh, Brock. Which reminds him of the word Baroque and Barrack and Bark and Poodle, Suzanne R. And this is his stream of consciousness. And it's not just words, there's some shapes and colors, who knows what else. And if I leave the slide up, you won't pay any attention to me at all. Because <laughs> <coughs> we learn quite a lot about his stream of consciousness here. So this is a brilliant metaphorical, metaphorical representation of what happens in a conscious mind. The thought balloon is a wonderful metaphor. Our, obviously, it's not true. It's not that our conscious thoughts uh, appear in colored ink in a little balloon above our heads. It's not literally true. But it's a beautiful metaphorical representation of what happens in a conscious mind. Now what I want to make is a further point, is that it is also a brilliant metaphorical representation of what happens in a zombie mind. And if you don't understand this, you're not understanding the philosophical concept of a zombie. Philosophers 
have chosen for reasons that strike me as under-motivated at best to talk about philosophical zombies. Philosophical zombies are not the horrible creatures from the, from the uh, sci-fi movies, the horror movies. Zombies are, by definition, beings that are just as lively and articulate and competent as anybody in this room. They're really good company, but they're completely unconscious. And it is deemed that this is a logical possibility. And so we have the problem, the zombie problem. How, how do we, what's the difference between a zombie and a genuinely conscious person like you or me? That's that is the philosophical setting. And notice it has some peculiar properties. There is no behavioral test at any grain level at all, nor any neurophysiological test at any grain level at all that can tell the difference between a zombie and a conscious person. That's by definition. So now we begin to realize that the concept of, a, of, a con of consciousness, of non-zombie consciousness, is sort of weird. It really is. Um, and since zombies, by definition, are not supposed to be supernatural miraculous, this is supposed to be not just logically possible, but not, as it were, uh, it doesn't require a leap of faith into some uh, supernatural realm, then we have to suppose that what a zombie does is explicable in terms of the goings-on inside the zombie's brain. So let's just go back for a moment. So suppose now this is a picture of a zombie's, not his state of his stream of consciousness, because he's not conscious, but it's his stream of unconsciousness. And he's got a stream of unconsciousness where a conscious person has a stream of consciousness. But the stream of unconsciousness is what the zombie uses to answer questions. For instance, if we bump into him and interrupt him and say, hey, have you been uh, thinking about uh, Greenberg today? And he says, well, yeah, just a minute ago I was thinking about Greenberg. Uh, and that reminded me of Monte Verdi and then Verdi and so forth. And all of the associations, all of the memory retrieval, all of the uh, uh, furnishing of short-term memory and all the rest of this that we naturally suppose goes with consciousness also happens in the zombie brain by definition. Otherwise, it would be miraculous. I mean, if somebody said, well, you could be a, there could be a zombie that was just, you know, really good company and a behaviorally uh, just like a conscious person, and inside his head it was just, uh, you know, chocolate ice cream, um, you'd say, well, I'm sorry, this, this is a fantasy that, that, that defies uh, uh, respect even. Uh, no, uh, uh, that's just helping yourself to a miracle. So if there are zombies, if we want to take the zombie problem seriously, then we have to suppose that the innards, that the zombie innards, the machinery in between the zombie's ears that subserves and makes possible and controls all that really cool behavior, answering our questions, falling for our uh, puns and jokes, uh, uh, showing fear and delight and love and hate and all the rest of those things, we have to suppose that that machinery is in there. It's just not adding that extra zing of consciousness. So it's a little bit of a strange idea. Um, the way to understand this is to distinguish between a zombie and a zimbo. This is a term I introduced in 91. Hasn't caught on, I'm not surprised. <laughs> because it's a sort of throwaway. By definition, a Zimbo is a zombie that is behaviorally complex thanks to a control system that permits recursive self-representation. You couldn't have a stream of unconsciousness like that fellow in the, in the painting without being a Zimbo. Now, there's lots of zombies that aren't Zimbos. I mean, your average crab, I think, would do pretty well, or insect. They're, they're sort of zombies, but they don't have the internal resources uh, uh, that, a, that a human being has. They, 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 don't, they aren't capable of the sort of behavioral sophistication of a human being. So, so this means that our problem, then, 
boils down to this. Since the Zimbo conscious distinction makes no discernible, and we can say behavioral if you like, but it doesn't really matter because we can go inside the brain and it counts there too. Since the Zimbo conscious distinction makes no discernible di difference, we can just ignore that difference. And then what must be explained is how selfish neurons of the sort I was talking about yesterday can be teamed up to make an architecture that this is a good metaphor for. That is, that the, that the, that the uh, uh, Steinberg thought balloon is a good metaphor for. In other words, can we make a Zimbo mind out of Turing bits? That's where we stand. Now, that's where I left off. Let me just continue, remind you what the last slide from yesterday was. I was distinguishing between friendly competition in the brain, which was controlled from a higher, by a higher level process, initiated, damped, turned off, turned on, and so forth, from what I was describing as open competition, which is capable of indefinite escalation. There are no traffic cops or bosses. It's a sort of anarchic regime, capable of some varieties of mutual self-limitation and modulation mutual inhibition and the like, and that this, in spite of the fact that this is competitive, it can be benign, it can actually serve the interests of the organism whose control system it is. That's the idea. Now, where does the conflict come from? Somebody asked yesterday, Look, if every brain cell is a direct descendant of a single cell, that is from the, uh, of the, the zygote, <coughs> they're all genetically identical. So how do they ever get into conflict with each other? Well, first of all, in a certain sense, they aren't all genetically identical. Even though they have the same genome, some of those genes are, as they say, imprinted, which means that they bear a trace, a chemical trace, of whether they came from your mother or your father. And it turns out that genomic imprinting of this sort has a, has a very clear effect in the brain. There is a division of labor so that some of your neurons are basically developing under the influence of a paternal copy of genes, and some of your neurons are developing under the influence of a maternal copy of your genes. And the result of this is that there's a tug of war between these two developmental pathways, and the benign outcome in the normal case is quite fine. And you get the right size cerebellum and everything works out right. But in uh, well-known uh, uh, genetic anomalies like uh, 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 Val uh, Willy, Willy, Prader, Willy Prader syndrome or, or Angelman syndrome, uh, where either the medumnal or the pedumnal copy of the gene is silenced, you get very severe uh, uh, abnormalities of psychology. And they are telltale, too, because if the paternal or pedumnal gene is, uh, is silenced, then you have a hyper clingy, friendly, smiley, uh, uh, non aggressive uh, child. And if the medumnal copy is silenced, you get a ferociously demanding, aggressive child that tries to uh, uh, extract as much possible uh, resources from the mother. Here you can see how the paternal and maternal genetic contributions have different interests, and these will express themselves if given a chance. Uh, David Haig, who I wish he could be here for this, as I've been talking about this with him, Harvard professor here, uh, in a wonderful paper of his called Intrapersonal Conflict. And he uh, was one of the sources of my thinking about, about uh, competition in the brain. He makes this point. He says, <coughs> internal conflict often seems maladaptive, consuming time, energy, and repose. If so, why does it persist? And the answer he comes up with is it persists because it can persist, and it can persist because there isn't the sort of transcendental unity of genetic identity that you might suppose. In fact, there's some disunity built right in, built right into the genome. Uh, another paper of his, Conflicting Messages, Genomic Imprinting and Internal Communication, uh, uh, goes into this in more detail. Um, I've been thinking, Mark, I haven't done it yet, I'm, alas. I'm going to uh, put a website up uh, with the papers that, that I talk about here, and then people who 
I'll try to remember to do that by tomorrow so that I can put the I can put the website on a slide and people can check out if they want to check out any of these papers. Now here's the late great Bill Hamilton writing in 1996. In life, what was it I really wanted? My own conscious and seemingly indivisible self was turning out far from what I had imagined, and I need not be so ashamed of my self-pity. I was an ambassador, ordered abroad by some fragile coalition, a bearer of conflicting orders from the uneasy masters of a divided empire. As I write these words, even so as to be able to write them, I am pretending to a unity that deep down, deep inside myself, I know does not exist. You couldn't put it, I think, any better than that. So, competitive neural architectures. Uh, if I'm going to be taken seriously on this as, as, as a proposal for how to think about, about computational architectures in the brain, uh, the question we need to ask is what phenomenology would distinguish them from other architectures? Phenomenology in the, in the original sense, that is, what, what phenomena, what, what behavioral phenomena, not just what's it like from the first person point of view. So, for instance, neural opportunism is what you would expect and of course, we have a lot of evidence of neural opportunism in the brain. If, uh, uh, when, whenever, uh, 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 well, famously, Mike Merzenich um, uh, ties a few fingers together, sutures a few fingers together on a monkey, and the, in the, the representation of those two fingers in the brain shrinks, and, and, and the regions of, of uh, neurons neighboring that take on other jobs. There's, there's a sense that neurons are always, neural tissue is always hungry to find more work to do. And it, it moves into any, any vacuum that's provided. If there's not work here, they'll look for work elsewhere. Um, escalations amid the no-brainers. That was what David Haig was talking about. We think about all the quandaries we go through, the, the terrible states we get into where we're just at war with ourselves and we have these two competing ideas and it's, whether it's an addiction and a and a, and a vow to go straight or, or whether or not to propose or not propose or any one of the really difficult uh, wrenching decisions of our life, we get these escalations and they don't seem to do us any good and they seem to be sort of pathological and we don't seem to be able to control them. Uh, just what you would expect on one of these views. Um, either you get de graceful degradation as we say uh, where a system is broken down because of uh, pathology, but it is promptly taken over by a neighboring system. The work is soon, is soon acquired by, uh, by a volunteer system nearby, or else you get really anarchic breakdowns when competitions really collapse. I've mentioned the, the Angelman and the, and the prader villi uh, syndrome, uh, but there's, there's many others if you think about uh, something like jargon aphasia, where, where the, the, <coughs> the speaking part of the, of the brain is no longer getting good direction, but it doesn't stop. It's cranking out like mad, uh, and it doesn't know any better, and it's just uh, doing its thing as best it can, and it can be very impressive, even though it's utterly uh, uh, garbage uh, for the most part. So the way I want you to think about this is as, as an architecture of constrained triers. Think about, and I, I'm not sure at which level or levels to think about these triers, many levels probably. These are neural tissues, neural subsystems. They're, they're constrained, of course, by their location and their, their competences and their connections and their talents, but they're always striving, and uh, they're always looking opportunistically for more things to do. And that's a rather different flavored architecture from the architectures we're familiar with uh, uh, in artificial intelligence. Although, as I said yesterday, they have their antecedents in going way back to Selfridge's pandemonium. So the take-home message, we're still on, on yesterday, actually, uh, of the first lecture. A brain composed of seriously competitive elements achieving a modicum of appropriate control thanks to the delicate balancing of uh, balanced factions. And 
An important point is that all the control is by what we might call sideways signaling. There's no top level. There's no master program that, that is master routine which is calling the others. All control is by mutual interactions of one sort or another. Quoting Haig, our passions, both positive and negative, are the carrots and sticks employed by genes to mold our actions to their ends. Reason may be a slave to the passions, but reason pursues pleasures as ends in themselves rather than as means to an end. So we get a, we get a, a control system which is basically uh, implemented in, in neuromodulator balance and, and the like, uh, 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 and not with the sort of strict hierarchy that you get in uh, uh, typical compu uh, computer systems. So here we are, Wednesday. Wednesday, what does our, the body need me for? Uh, what is the conscious self and do all minds have them? <coughs> and then tomorrow, how does the self get culturally inculcated? So now here we are today. Okay. Imagining consciousness in an ant mind is the first section and the second. And last section is why might consciousness develop in such a mind? So here we go. Uh, a few years ago, I was interviewed by Giorgio Giorello in, uh, for Corriere della Sera in Milano. And it was a very nice interview, but the headline was what I loved. It's become my slogan ever since then. Si abbiamo un'anima, mai fatta di tanti piccoli robot. Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. <laughs> and ever since then I thought, that's exactly right. That is my view. We do have a soul in the important sense that we have a something in us that is the seat and, and source of our moral responsibility, our moral worth. It is also the seat of our consciousness. It is the self, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. There's nothing else it could be made of. And I, I showed uh, those tiny robots. Do you want to see a little bit more of the tiny robots? It's such a, it's such a beautiful, uh, let's see if I can, wait a minute. Uh, and I need to go to Control Tab, isn't it? No, oh, Alt Tab. Here we are. And then I go play. And then I enlarge. Oh. And then I go play. Okay, this is the Bo Harvard BioVision's. Never mind the music, but there it is. We're stuck with it. So this is really, aside from the imaginative coloring, a very accurate portrayal of what's going on in, within every cell in your body. The complexity is just staggering. And I particularly want to show it to you because of the motor proteins, which if those aren't robots, I don't know what is. <coughs> motor proteins, as the name suggests, they're just proteins. They're not alive. They're just large molecules, and they are the porters. They carry materials around in your cells where you need them. We get the self-assembly of these microtubules. We get, here we go. And then once the microtubules are there, look what, what marches along them. There it is. That's a motor protein. And that's really what they're like. It's amazing. OK, that's enough of that, I guess. Just wanted you to see that. It is pretty amazing. So you've got hundreds of billions of cells, trillions and trillions of motor robots, uh, 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 motor proteins, and you couldn't live without them. And this, these are the materials, the only materials, that, out of which we're going to have to make consciousness. Now, those motor proteins certainly aren't conscious. And I would say the cells certainly aren't conscious. They are fabulously complex machines, nanomachines. That's what they are. Now, the first thing to note is that the teams of robots don't seem to need you or me. For instance, consider your immune system. 
it's a very brilliantly coordinated system, and you're not involved in that at all. You don't really pay attention to it. You don't direct it with your mind at all. It's just, it's just a benign system that you have that cranks along without any need of consciousness, so far as anyone can tell. It has a mind of its own. Hand-eye coordination. You can be out there picking blueberries and having a conversation and hardly paying attention to what your hand is doing. And long before you're sort of actually cognizant of exactly what you're doing, your hand is already moving over to pick up the next berries. You're just, that's a sort of an automatic pilot. So, so your body really does have a, a, a mind of its own. Uh, a tremendous amount of what you do, walking, Living your life can be done without benefit of consciousness of any sort at all. So then what's it there for? What, what's it really there for? Now, in order to get clear about this, I want to contrast two thought experiments uh, familiar to many of you, maybe all of you, I don't know. One of them is Ned Block's Chinese Nation, and the other is Doug Hofstadter's Ant Fugue. They're really remarkably similar, but I don't think anybody's ever put them together before. <coughs> so Ned Block, in his paper Troubles with Functionalism, uh, runs a, a thought experiment where he imagines this is supposed to be an argument against functionalism, and more particularly against sort of strong AI functionalism. So he says, suppose we have an AI program which ex hypothesi uh, implements consciousness, and we write this program as a whole, as a, as a billion subroutines or sub-steps, and we write those out and we give them to every person in China. So we have a billion Chinese people dutifully hand-simulating a little bit of program and feeding the results through satellites and telephones and so forth, so that they, for an hour, the system realizes this, this, this computational architecture. Okay. Well, first I want to point out, the amusing given my comments of yesterday, that, that Ned does choose a Marxist experiment, and these particular uh, units, these modules, these Chinese, are, are docile, obedient, they're not, they're not behaving greedily, we just imagine they're getting their, their, their meal, three meals a day, and they're doing their job, and they're just, you know, they're slavish. Uh, and they're doing sort of minimalized hand simulations, the idea is whatever level and, and Ned doesn't go into this. At whatever level uh, the program is written, uh, the smallest steps are what are taken over by these Chinese people. And the question that Ned raises about this is, is, the, is would a, a robot that had the nation of China thus enslaved as its mind, would it be conscious? Right? That's the question. How many of you say, no? How many of you say, yes? How many of you say, I don't know? <laughs> okay. This is what Bloch's conclusion is. There is a prima facie doubt. I went back to check this this morning because I just want to make sure I didn't overstate the case. There is a prima facie doubt whether there is anything which it is like to be the homunculi-headed system. There is a prima facie doubt. Oh, I grant that. There is a prima facie doubt. That's the only conclusion that you can draw. It's the only conclusion one would be at all warranted in drawing. But a lot of people draw the conclusion, aha, you see that shows that functionalism is false because this uh, imagined robot would not be conscious. Well, it's interesting because Doug Hofstadter has an almost identical thought experiment with the opposite conclusion. And that's his ant fugue. Now this was originally published in Gödel Escher Bach and then we republished it in the mind's eye. And there, there you can see down at the bottom uh, the youthful Doug and the youthful me. You see, I was trying to look like Rasputin back then. <laughs> and uh, so in Doug's ant fugue from Gödel Escherbach, what he imagines is an ant colony that he's treating as a person. And he calls it Aunt Hillary. And... Uh, the units here are not Chinese, they're ants, which are, first of all, they're, they're mobile, but they're also fairly autonomous, and, and they're not quite as slavish, actually, as the Chinese in, in, uh, in Ned's experiment. And uh, he imagines them interacting in all sorts of ways. Ed Wilson would love this. 
I never talked to Ed about this particular thought experiment, but I think I should. Because Ed, for years, has been stressing that an ant colony is really a superorganism. And, and Doug is simply carrying this to the sort of logical extreme. No more outrageous than, than Ned's billion Chinese. Oh, I have to tell you. <laughs> I have to tell you a little story. Some years ago, when Nick Humphrey, it must have been 87 or 8, Nick Humphrey was at Tufts with me, and we gave a seminar together on consciousness. Uh, really philosophy seminar. And I had a visiting student from Beijing, uh, Ji Hu Min. And his English was not very good, and he arrived in the country, and he very eager to take this seminar, and he comes into the seminar, and the first week, what do we talk about? Searle's Chinese room. <laughs> and the second week, what do we talk about? Blocks enslaving the Chinese nation. <laughs> and Hu Min is sort of looking around, and he, is this the way they do philosophy here? It was... It was an unforgettable experience. Yeah. Well, at any rate, um, the, the ant hill, uh, the ants are just as clueless about the larger phenomenon as the Chinese are in Ned's case. Remember, competence without comprehension. And Doug asks if the whole is conscious, and he doesn't think it's even an issue. If it's organized right, the answer is yes. Well, now, how intelligent, actually, how conscious could a mind made of ants be? Well, Doug imagines that Aunt Hillary has language and can have a conversation. He describes talking with Aunt Hillary about various things. He's not talking to individual ants. He's talking to the person that is Aunt Hillary, whose vocalizations are somehow composed out of all of the efforts of, of all of these ants. Well, uh, I hope you realize that ant colonies, in fact, cannot do that. <laughs> this is just a brute fact. They're just not up to having conversations with us. And I can't prove that. And I'm sure there's some people who think they can talk to ant colonies. And I know they're right. They can. They just don't get talked back to <laughs> <coughs> uh, or understood. Now, uh, but what I think Doug was saying, and I know he was saying, was that it was in principle possible. That is, in principle, if you took enough ants and you organized them in the right way, they would be capable of not just making the sort of zombie ant mind that an ant colony manifestly does have, check with Ed Wilson, but a, a, a mind which was capable of having a conversation. So here we have a clash of intuitions with Bloch saying no consciousness, Hofstadter saying consciousness. I'm not going to try to resolve it directly, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that, that this is an area where, where uh, uh, there's, there's a clash of, con uh, of uh, intuitions. But if Bloch is right, then it seems to me that dualism of some sort is true. If it is not possible in principle to get those uh, ants or those Turing bits to make consciousness, why? Well, um, I want to briefly hark back to an idea of mine of the myth of double transduction. Here's a very, very tempting way to think about what happens in, in the mind. First of all, right now, photons are rushing in and acoustic waves are banging on your ears, and these are transduced at the hair cells and at the rods and cones, and they're all turned into spike trains and nerves. So, so we have transduction. We go from one medium to another, from photons to, to spikes, from acoustic waves to spikes. So we get everything into spike trains. Now we're in, in the brain. And if we look at the other end of the nervous system, if we look at the output end, we see that in order to get my arms to go up and down and my lips to flap, there have to be uh, spike trains in the motor neurons that are innervating the muscles to get all of that to happen. Well, what happens in the middle? That's the question. And it's tremendously tempting to think there has to be a second transduction. That first you go from electromagnetic radiation into spike trains, and then you transduce that into color and into sound. And there has to be this medium somewhere where, ta-da, the colors and the sounds are are presented as a result of this second transduction event. And I'm saying, not if materialism is true. 
There is no other medium. It's spike trains all the way. That's it. That's all we got in there. There's, we go from the input transducers to the output effectors, and in the middle, there's all kinds of processing and transformation, but it's all in one medium. It's all in the medium of neural signaling transduction, uh, 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 spike trains. So this idea that there's this intermediate place where this second transduction happens has just got to be false on pain of, of giving up materialism. So back here to all the colors and shapes. How on earth, how could we explain this how can we imagine this if we don't imagine this second transduction event? Well, I'm going to help you imagine it right now. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to show you something. Okay, you saw something grow and shrink, grow and shrink, grow and shrink. Okay, now. I'm still doing it, but there's no screen on. I'll turn the screen back on. I hope. If that doesn't turn the screen back on, I'm in deep trouble. Ah, good. There we go. When there's no screen on, there's a process going on in the computer, which is the, the vehicle for that motion. It isn't that motion, it's simply that's the way that motion is represented in the computer. There's something which sort of stands for that that's going on. It's not colored, it's not white, it has no particular shape or size, but it is lawfully correlated with that. Now, that's the sort of thing that must be going on in your brain What's going on in his brain have got to be lots of processes, computational processes, and one of the processes is for red, and one is for green, and one is for Greenberg, actually many processes, and they happen, and they are associated, and they call each other up, and they interact in all of these ways, and it's all just computation. And your computer doesn't need the screen in order to do its computation, and your brain doesn't need a special screen either. It's all dark in there. It's just spike trains. It's all just in the medium in your brain of spike trains. In the computer, it's just mediums of bit strings. Okay. So now, on to what might conscious how why might consciousness develop in such a mind? Uh, so the difference between the mind of an ant colony, that is a non-Zimbo zombie, and a human mind, a Zimbo, is a difference in the organization of the parts. They've got the same kind of parts, neurons, glial cells, and the like, and it's not just sheer numbers that counts, it's clearly organization that matters. In other words, there's a lot of R&D, a lot of design that has to go in, a lot of redesign that has to go into getting the right parts structured in the right way so that the right things will happen. So it all boils down to a question of getting the right R&D to create the structure that makes for a Zimbo mind. And remember, if we, as far as I'm concerned, if we can get to a Zimbo mind, we're home free. Because the difference between a Zimbo and a really conscious person is illusory. So I'm taking on the slightly easier job, at least for the imagination, of saying, how could the R&D to make a Zimbo mind out of a non-Zimbo mind, how could that be accomplished? Well, the organization or the rewiring can come from three sources. It can come from genes, or be, as we tend to say, hardwired. It can come from developmental processes, or it can come from learning, or as we might say, software. Now, in order to think about this, I want to draw attention to something about which there's been a great deal of research, and that is whether chimps can learn language. And the answer, it turns out, pretty clear, is no. No. 
there have been lots of attempts over the last 50 years, really, to teach chimps a natural language, and neither chimps nor bonobos really, it never kindles, it never takes off. They may learn hundreds of <coughs> gestures, hundreds of symbols, but they never get into really spontaneous language use of any sort, not, e not even Kanzi, the bonobo. Uh, so it looks as if, too bad, chimps just are unable to acquire language. Well, no doubt it's because of something in the... They've got roughly enough neurons. They've got as many neurons in their brain as, as you or I do. You know, must be something about the organization of those neurons that prevents them from doing it. They've got ears. They've got some other equipment. What do you suppose it might be? Why is it? Well, they lack the brain organization to do it. <coughs> well, how might they acquire it? Well, one thing we could do is we could go in and we could rewire by hand, or we could try changing some genes and see if by changing some genes we could get the genes to do the rewiring that would give the, the chimps the capacity to learn language. Well, how big a gene change would this have to be? It might not have to be all that large, actually. I want to give you a sort of... Uh, shoot from the hip scary hypothesis, just because it illustrates my point so nicely. Here's a curious fact about chimpanzees. There have been probably thousands of chimpanzees now who have spent their entire life from birth to death in, in a human institution, in, in captivity. And those chimpanzees have heard roughly as much human language as a child would hear. And they never show any interest. It's just like the rustling of the leaves. They're just not interested. They don't attend. Now, it would be in their interest to attend. They could learn a lot. They could learn, I don't know, how to pick the locks or when the food was coming. Or You'd think there'd be lots of reasons for them to be, pay, well, lots that they could benefit from, from figuring out all the information in that Auditory knows, but they never, they never show much interest in it at all. So imagine, compare that to a human infant. They are really interested in vocal sounds. And even deaf children are really interested in communication. Imagine that we change, I'm going to imagine one little gene in the chimpanzee genome to turn up the gain in the curiosity about interest in speech sounds. Suddenly these become intensely interesting to chimpanzees in a way they never were before. This would have a cascading developmental effect, or it might very well, and who knows what the result of that would be? Who knows? Of course we don't know, but it is not completely out of the question that that might be all it would take to turn a chimpanzee brain into a brain that could learn language. So that would be a case where we can see that it's the developmental and learning history that plays a big role, but a single genetic change might be all it took. Uh, that's just to illustrate the, the interplay between genes, development, and learning. <coughs> So the chimps, as I say, have, have no curiosity about, about speech sounds. And this may be their main, their main shortcoming. So the organization for language might follow quite directly from a few minor genetic changes. Well, but now what about the self? Uh, language is one thing, but what about the self? Because that's what we're really talking about here. The organization that gives you one of those souls made of robots. Uh, might it be due to genes, development, uh, learning. Of course, the line between development and learning is, is porous in any case. Well, it too must depend on the organization of the brain. <clears throat> here are a few quotes about, about the self. Here's Dan Wagner. Is Dan here today? There you are. Hi, Dan. I said I was going to get to you. Didn't get to you yesterday. I got to you today. He says, we can't possibly know, let alone keep track of, the tremendous number of mechanical influences on our behavior because we inhabit an extraordinarily complicated machine. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, who's this we? 
that inhabits the brain. Has Dan gone Cartesian on us? Is this a, is this a race cogitans? I don't think so. I don't think so. Here's George Ainsley writing in Breakdown of Will. I highly, highly recommend that book, too. Philosophers and psychologists are used to speaking about an organ of unification called the self that can variously be autonomous, divided, individuated, fragile, well-bounded, and so on. But this organ doesn't have to exist as such. What on earth does that mean? How could an organ that doesn't have to exist as such exist at all? Well, by being a virtual machine in the brain. But why would it exist? That's what we're looking at now. Here's Michael Frame, who is quite a philosopher in his own right, not just a playwright and funny writer. Odd, though, all these dealings of mine with myself. First I've agreed a principle with myself. Now I'm making out a case to myself and debating my own feelings and intentions with myself. Who is this self, this phantom internal partner with whom I'm entering into all these arrangements? I ask myself. <laughs> and I think he answers his own question. I ask myself. That is, in fact, the key. That is the key to why we have a self. David McFarland, uh, writing in 1989, uh, this is not a quote, this is a paraphrase. Communication, he argues, is the only behavior that requires an organism to self-monitor its own control system. That's not a very good picture of David. That's the only picture I could find on the web. So I'll show you a picture of his new book, which I highly recommend. I'm writing a review of it right now. Guilty Robots, Happy Dogs. Um, a lot of the people I've been talking about, almost none of the people I've been talking about are philosophers, and yet they're philosophers, uh, some more than others. David is a fearless philosopher. He takes on the whole philosophy of mind literature in this book uh, from his robotics and animal behavior perspective, and it makes for very interesting and sometimes chastising reading by, uh, by philosophers because he's sympathetic and intelligent and inquisitive and he reads everything sort of cross cut to what you expect and comes up with some interesting things. Now what does he mean? Let's talk about communication because there's many different kinds of communication. Uh, uh, Mark mentioned the verb, uh, uh, alarm calls, that's a kind of communication. There's bird song, well known. There are pheromone trails by ants. There's even quorum sensing in bacteria recently discovered and much written about uh, phenomenon. But these, although these are kinds of communication, and you can read all about them in Mark's book on, on communication, uh, on the evolution of communication, but they're not tactical communication of the sort that uh, McFarland is talking about. Tactical communication is a really a new kind of behavior, and it leads to new types of action, action types, asking and answering, ordering, refusing, lying, promising. And these behavior types require new control structures to keep track of relevant conditions. This, I think, is the source of the architecture. And I think Talleyrand put his finger on it. Language was invented so that people could conceal their thoughts from each other. <coughs> this wonderful bit of cynicism, I think, actually expresses an important truth. And it's led me, inspired me to name something. I'm going to call this the Talleyrand buffer. The Talleyrand buffer is a, a, a functional place in the brain for preparing and planning tactical communication. And that means that it has to take into account all the possibilities and uh, suppress those that are not relevant. The last thing you want to do if you're going to be a communicator is simply broadcast everything on your mind. That is a recipe for disaster. That's not communicating. That's just betraying all your inner secrets. So tactical communication means bottling things up and deciding when to say what to whom. And for that, you need the Talleyrand buffer. And it doesn't take all possibilities 
into account, it only takes in those that are accessible to the buffer. So notice, I'm not saying, I know the, the caricature of my position is that consciousness is just talking to yourself. No, talking to yourself is a large part of consciousness, but by far, not, not, not remotely all or even most of consciousness. But I am saying, I am suggesting <coughs> that tactical communication, talking, is the behavior that drives the creation of the Taliban buffer. If you're not a tactical communicator, you don't have this structure in your nervous system because you don't need it. And it's not going to be there if you don't need it. Here's a clue from Dan Wegner. He writes, a voluntary action is something a person can do when asked. There are things that aren't, you can't do when asked. If I ask you to uh, 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 dilate your arteries or... Uh, um, uh, change your heartbeat or something like that. You can't just do that. But if I ask you, uh, everybody now just please raise your right hand, you can do that because you hear the words, they go in there, and this is one of the things that is accessible to that, to that arena, the arena that's accessible from language. Many years ago, I introduced the distinction between a personal level and a subpersonal level, and this is where it resides. And I now have a slightly new way of putting the point. The task of providing access to others, to second persons, is what creates the first person. If it wasn't for the, the communicative interaction between first and second person, there wouldn't be a first person point of view. Why are you doing that, somebody asks. Doing what? And if you can engage in that, if you know what you're doing, that's a voluntary and conscious act, and it's conscious because it's accessible to this, to this world of, uh, of uh, verbal communication. Now here, this raises then a good question. Is there a personal level for an ant colony? If you read Ed Wilson's book, you'll see in a way, yeah, there is. He talks throughout the book about the sort of organismic level. But it's only for us observer interpreters. There's no reason at all to think that there's a personal level for the ant colony itself. It has no behaviors that require it to, as it were, think of itself at the personal level. There isn't a personal level for it. There's only a personal level when we conceive of it uh, or try to interpret it. Now, I'm, I said I was going to mention Doug's new book, I Am a Strange Loop. He says this, among other things. Uh, highly recommend this book. I dare say this book would be semi-penetrable and not very enticing to most of the people here uh, without having heard the last two lectures. I hope now that it will be, uh, it'll go down like candy because you'll see that a lot of what I've been saying is sort of leading up to understanding what Doug's up to in this book. The pressures of daily life require us, force us to talk about events at the level on which we directly perceive them. Access at that level is what our sensory organs, our language, and our culture provide us with. Access to the, at that level is what our sensory organs, our language, and our culture provide us with. It is interaction between our basic perceptual needs and our language and our culture that creates the personal level, that creates the manifest image, to use uh, uh, Wilfred Sellers' term, uh, where we live at the personal level. Hofstadter, in his book, talks about what he calls active symbols, um, which are closely related to the active and the, the constrained triers that I've been talking about. I've been speaking more in neural terms. He's been taking that for granted and speaking at a higher level. In other words, people seeking the reader for configurations of active symbols may accept the idea of symbols galore being triggered in the brain, but they refuse to call that kind of internal churning consciousness because now they want the symbols themselves to be perceived. And Doug's point is, and my point is, no. We're beyond that. You, 
the perception is already embodied in the very activity of the symbols. We've already taken that task and distributed. Remember Leibniz's mill and Leibniz's failure of imagination. Um, here's something I call the dilemma of the subject. I'm almost through. If you leave the subject in your theory, you have not yet begun. That's where you have a, a, a conscious homunculus still sitting there in the Cartesian theater. That won't do. That's not a theory of consciousness at all. You have to take the work done by that homunculus and break it down into parts that are not conscious, that are lesser competences. If you don't leave the subject in your theory, you're evading the main issue, according to somebody like David Chalmers. It's what he calls the hard problem. Well, something's got to give here. I've made it very clear where I stand. You've got to get rid of the subject. You've got to break the subject down into a lot of little ants, a lot of little termite bits, and they won't be conscious. And we have to explain consciousness in terms of the activity of things that are not themselves conscious, or we don't have an explanation. Now, this view strikes fear and trembling and disgust in many people. Some people really hate it. I'm going to just share a few of my favorites. Jerry Fodor. If, in short, there's a community of computers living in my head, there'd also better be somebody who is in charge. And by God, it had better be me. <laughs> you can always count on Jerry to lay it on the line very vividly. Uh, Bob Wright. Of course, the problem here is with the claim that consciousness is identical to physical brain states. The more Dennett at all try to explain to me what they mean by this, the more convinced I become that what they really mean is that consciousness doesn't exist. And then my favorite of all time, Daniel Dennett is the devil. <laughs> there is no internal witness, no central recognizer of meaning, and no self other than an abstract center of narrative gravity, which is itself nothing but a convenient fiction. For Dennett, it is not a case of the emperor having no clothes. It's rather that the clothes have no emperor. Exactly! <laughs> if you still got the emperor in there, you don't have a theory of consciousness. No, he's got it right. So, so this, is, uh, uh, this passage by Voorhees is, 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 is my, my counterpart to the, to the quote I began with yesterday about Darwin, you know, the, about absolute ignorance. This outrage. This is simply pre-Darwinian, pre-Turing thinking expressing itself in outrage. This was a diagram that I put in, in uh, Consciousness Explained to get across the idea of how you could have a virtual machine which grew out of talking to yourself. Uh, suppose there's a part of your brain that, that, that X in this area, X needs uh, some information from this area, but there isn't any, it isn't wired upright to get that information. So just like prisoners in a, in a, in a jail, uh, it arranges for a message to go out, out of the mouth and in the ear, and that triggers something which lets X get the answer indirectly, and then you can uh, uh, make that, uh, you can shorten that pathway out, and pretty soon you've got parts of the brain talking to each other which don't naturally talk to each other. They're not wired up to talk to each other, and they learn to talk to each other by uh, ag aggressive uh, trial and error, sorting things out, and they create a new architecture as they go. Nobody knows how much of the computational architecture of human consciousness is hardware and how much is software. I am betting just because it's a, a, a more, I think, interesting and, and extreme position, and let's shoot it down first, that a lot is software. Let's find out. So tomorrow the lecture will be on the way that cultural software restructures our brains. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> so what I, I, I forgot to uh, mention at the beginning of, uh, of today is that, um, uh, as in yesterday's uh, lecture, um, each of the lectures in the series is followed by a commentary from one of our uh, faculty members. And today, the commentary will be from Professor Sean Nichols, who's in the Department of Philosophy. Um, so I'm going to invite Sean up to make some comments uh, to Dan. And then Dan will have uh, some time to respond. And then we'll open it up for some more questions. So Sean Kelly.
it's okay if I close this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, terrific. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to to be able to uh, give comments on on Dan's talk. I wish I had a witty kind of story about my initial interaction with him. Unfortunately, my initial personal personal interaction with Dan was only a few years ago, but I do remember uh, 25 years ago when I was an undergraduate, uh, a well-thumbed uh, copy of, of Brainstorms that was very important for me and also a well-thumbed copy of The Mind's Eye that was very, very important for me. And I think that's one of the, one of the great things that Dan's able to do. He's able to reach out to poor little you know, undergraduates like me who don't know anything but have lots and lots of questions and help you get a sense for why those questions, how you might be able to approach those questions and why they might be the kind of thing around which you could uh, build a, a career or a life or, or how you could at any rate get better focus on them. So I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude uh, to you for that. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to be able to say some things. Um, I, I want to, I, I really would just want to ask some questions, and uh, the, the reason I want to ask some questions is because I, I'm very, very sympathetic with the idea that in some way or another, it must be the brain that's responsible for, uh, for consciousness, and that if we're ever going to give an account of consciousness, it's got to be an account that's, uh, that's given in terms of the, the you know, basic underlying substructure. That, that causes conscious states. Um, on the other hand, I think that um, it's really consciousness that we've got to explain. <laughs> and so I, I want to, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not always sure that I, that I feel like um, that's, uh, I, I feel like that's getting swept other, under the rug every once in a while. And so I want to try to focus that a little bit. I think that uh, a lot of the people that Dan argues with People, philosophers, for instance, I'm a philosopher, philosoph uh, but philosophers like Tom Nagel and John Searle, uh, who've given um, criticisms, or, or Ned Block even, who've given criticisms of various kinds of functionalism. At least some of those people, uh, I think, agree with the idea that ultimately it, there's, you'd like to aim at least for the possibility of giving a uh, theory of consciousness in terms of, in terms of the brain. They just despair at the possibility of doing it. They think, my goodness, it, this is what we've got to aim for, and it's almost impossible to understand how we could, how we could manage to make any headway here. And uh, they'll do, th I've heard John Searle, for instance, who, who was an advisor of mine, say, you know, it's, it, I don't know how we're going to do it. We've got to do it. It's the thing we've got to do. And doggone it, those brain scientists better get to work because they're the people who need to, give, uh, who need to be able to give the answer. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and, and even Nagel, when he, when he wrote his original paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Uh, the, the conclusion of that paper that nobody really pays much attention to is the idea that somehow the physical stuff and the mental stuff, they seem like there's this vast chasm between them. And, and so then he articulates a project. He says, look, that must mean that we ought to get some way of understanding uh, a way to describe the physical stuff and a way to describe the mental stuff such that it doesn't look like there's this enormous chasm. And then he you know, starts on that project uh, but, doesn't, but doesn't get any far, uh, doesn't get very far. And I think it's very hard to get far and I, I guess I just want to say one or two things about why I think it's hard to get far and then ask you to help us understand how, how your proposal does it. Mm -hmm. so, so the first thing is I, I, met, I said, if we're going to give an, an explanation of consciousness in terms of the physical states of the brain, it better be an explanation of consciousness. And I, I, th I think you say, you say that sometimes, and I think you believe it in some sense or another. On the other hand, Every time the explanation comes, I feel like somehow I enter into the state of being a zombie. I just don't, there's nothing going on in me <laughs> that helps me to understand what it is that you're saying that's supposed to help us get across this gap. Or maybe I'm a zim Zimbo, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I might be a Zimbo. Well, you're maybe. at least a Zimbo. At least a Zimbo, that, I appreciate that. <laughs> I think. We're all Zimbos. 
I mean, here's one of the places where, where, where I feel like I enter this altered state. I, I, when, you, when you talk about the myth of double transduction, you say, uh, look, we all agree that you've got photons and acoustic signals and they're transduced into neural spikes. And we all agree that you get this motor neural, these motor neural spike trains as outputs. Uh, and, uh, but, but what you want to deny is that there's this intermediate thing, the, 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 that there's this transduction into colors and sounds which get appreciated by the self and, and so on. And, and I, think, I think, you know, when I listen to a great, when I listen to a Bach fugue, I, I listen to this thing, and doggone it, if there isn't that thing, that, that appreciation of the colors and the sounds by the self, then, uh, then it seems like, which it seems like you want to deny, if there isn't that appreciation of the colors and sounds by the self, then it seems like you've denied the, the very thing that we want to explain. Now, and, and what, I, what I want to say to you is, if you have a hard time finding that intermediate thing, Dan, then you've got to try harder, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think <laughs> it's not, you know, we both got to try hard, but you've yeah. got to try harder there. And, uh, and now, I, but I think you ultimately, you want to give, give us some hints, some clues about what the, this explanation is going to be done in terms of. Mm -hmm. And there, there are three things that I got out of the talk, um, both, both yesterday's talk and today's talk, that seem, that seem central. And, and, I, and I don't quite understand how they're going to do the trick. So let me just put the three things on the table. Uh, the first is, uh, has to do with the organization of the cells. I mean, so you, you want to ask, surely it's got to be right that the way the cells in the brain are organized is crucial to their ability to give rise to, uh, to our conscious states. But you want to know what is it about the organization of the cells that allows us to shed any light on the idea that the brain cells so organized uh, should be able to give rise to conscious states, but the, you know, the ants and the anthill thus, you know, not so organized can't. What, what is it about the organization? How does that do the trick of helping us to understand what's, uh, the, how we should describe what goes on at the physical level in such a way that it helps us to explain how that stuff will, will give rise to conscious states? So the organization seems to be important. The fact that, this, that the organizational subunits are active rather than passive seems to be important. And that, that, again, that seems right. I, I, it, seems, uh, it seems right to think that these cells aren't busy just passively recording inputs. And that, I mean, they, ha they have a certain kind of, mo I don't know what you call it. We'll, let's anthropomorphize and we'll call it a certain kind of motivation of their own. They go ahead, but they, they go ahead and do stuff. Uh, you say the neural tissue is always hungry to find more work to do. Uh, and, and that seems all right. That seems right. But, but once we pay attention to that, how does it help us understand mm -hmm. that the stuff, in virtue of having that character, could give rise to conscious states? And then uh, finally, there's this thing that you said yesterday, and you started out at the beginning saying it. Uh, and I don't understand this either. But, but I feel like it's crucial. So if I could understand it, maybe I would, maybe I would, you know, move out of the zombie-like state. It's you say these these little subunits, they they have to be unconscious, competent agencies that are. And then you use this phrase. It was on there. I saw it. I know it was there. Semi-comprehending. Mm -hmm. These these subunits are semi-comprehending, and I know that that's less than fully comprehending, but. But I don't know what it is. I and, and I feel like if I understood what it was for these units, these subunits, the neural cells, for instance, to, be, to have this, fe this feature of being semi-comprehending, then maybe I could understand how if you had a whole bunch of those organized in a certain yeah. way, in such a way that they were actively inter you know, interacting with one another, then I could get how you get consciousness out of it. Uh, but so hopefully maybe you can help us understand those kinds of things. Great. OK. Thank you, Sean. That was great. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't ask for better commentary than that, Sean. That's really very good. Um, I'm just going to make sure I get the right... Yes. I think, 
I think you're right about, say, Nagel and, and Searle, that they look at this and they, they just despair of the possibility. And to me, this has always struck me as exactly like uh, Bateson, just giving up rather than taking seriously the thing that's right in front of him. He said, no, no, chromatin, is this no way, no way, no way that could explain. Well, now, you know, 100 years later, less than that, we, we understand, no, it's the chromatin, and it's just much, much more complicated than you thought, and here's how it works. And, and so he gets egg on his face because he couldn't, he couldn't take seriously that idea. Now, as you say, there's this huge apparent gulf between consciousness and machinery. And remember, that's what I said was great about Darwin's idea. It united ethics and poetry and consciousness at the one extreme with physics and chemistry. And Turing's, I think, it's the same uh, great idea applied, if you like, uh, synchronously rather than uh, uh, over time. Darwin's idea explains how we got to these incredibly complicated machines. And then Turing does the, 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 the decomposition uh, uh, in the individual. And in both cases, what you see is a gradual accretion of competence. And with it comes behavioral comprehension. And with more competence comes more comprehension. And with more competence comes more comprehension. And this is something we see, I think, just routinely if we look at computers. And if we think about what Turing's computer could do was not much more than addition. It just, it just did a little mathematics. But now we have uh, uh, the whole world of software, tremendous competence, and a kind of comprehension, right? Now, if you want examples of, of uh, 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 semi-comprehending competences, just uh, call up one of those uh, uh, computer travel agents and see if you can make a, train, a plane reservation on it. <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> now, you might say, well, that's not very much comprehension. And I agree, it's not very much. But it would have blown away somebody in the 19th century. The idea that you could get that much, comp that much competence out of a machine would have just staggered people. And so we've come used to the fact that there's lots of competence which everybody used to think, everybody used to think required comprehension. And now we know it doesn't. Now, you can either say it doesn't require any competition, any comprehension at all, because after all, it's a machine. But if you make that move, then you're, what you're doing is you're sweeping comprehension under the rug again and again and again. So you've turned it into this sort of magical property, which only exists uh, you know, at, in, in, as the cherry on top of the dessert at the very end. No, what you have to understand is that it's, it's an incremental process, just as I would say life itself and consciousness itself, these are Darwinian messages, they, they gradually accrete and more and more competences evolve and now we can say this is clearly alive. The virus isn't alive, the motor protein isn't alive, but the cell is alive. Uh, uh, nothing smaller than a cell is really alive. Well, how about a mitochondrion? Is it alive? You know, uh, that same gradualist perspective that we now take for granted, I hope, in, in biology, we should start taking for granted in cognitive science too and seeing that Turing's great move is to show us that we have these tools. When, when, when Descartes imagined the Turing test and said any, any, any thing that you can have a conversation with has to have a human mind, and he imagined making a, a, a machine, an automaton. He said, oh yeah, you could have a few, you could say a few things. You push it here and it'd say one thing. Push it there and say another thing. But he said, you would never have a conversation with it. Well, the reason he was so sure that's true was that he was imagining clockwork. He wasn't imagining a machine with a trillion moving parts. 
he would not have known how to take seriously imagining a machine with a trillion human parts, any more than Bateson knew how to take seriously imagining that there were you know, a bi billions of moving parts inside a single bit of, of, of chromatin. Uh, once we take the idea of a machine with a trillion moving parts seriously, we should also take seriously that if we try harder, we can actually see how that machine can do the work. But now that, I know, is just leading up to the, to the main issue that you have here. Um, let's talk about the Bach fugue for a minute. I've always found that whereas people are very keen to get the colors in their heads, you know, I mean, close your eyes and think of a red rose, or you got that color in your head. But when they imagine music, even though it's in a key, even though it's at a particular rhythm, they, they don't think that there's, you know, striking up a little band somewhere in their head. They're not surprised that there's no place in the head where there's, where there's music. There is, a, there is a, a something which is, if you like, even the appreciation of music. What you have to, when you give up that inner transduction, all the work that would be done in this other medium has to be parceled out into all of those spike trains. It has to be distributed to all of these unconscious brain parts. And you have to take the very appreciation of that Bach fugue, and that has to be implemented in, constituted by, the interactions of these parts. Now, if you can't imagine how the deliciousness of listening to Brahms could be implemented in interacting parts of, of neural computation, I agree, it's very hard to imagine it. But I think we're making progress. <coughs> by the way, I'd mention uh, <coughs> a lovely book by David Huron. <coughs> A, a musicologist and cognitive neuroscientist, a book called Sweet Anticipation. He does a brilliant job of showing how, as it were, musical pleasure and displeasure gets cashed out in terms of, of neural computation. Uh, this is, this, I gotta tell you, this is, this is such a, uh, a clever thing. I said to him in a letter, I said, uh, I'm gonna have great fun rubbing philosophers' noses in your stuff about musical qualia. Here's what he did. He took a, I don't know, 100, 200 trained musicians, and he asked them just to free associate about what it's like to hear the different scale tones, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Of course, do, if you're a musician, you know, that's, that's home, that's basic, it's secure, it's solid, whereas T is, is uh, anticipatory, unstable, heading home, da 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 and then Fa and Mi and, and Re, they all, have, they all have their different flavors, their different qualia, and he uses the word qualia. And so he gets people to just talk and talk and talk. He doesn't give them lists to check off. He has them generate the vocabulary to describe the qualia of musical tones. Then he subjects all of that data to sophisticated statistical analysis, and he can get some really nice patterns to come out of it, and he turns out that it's, there's nothing random about it, it really falls into some clear patterns, and he can show how he can explain these families of terms in terms of the effect in the brain of uh, different kinds of anticipation and surprise. And so he's got a reductionist account of the qualia of, of scale tones. And, and who would have imagined that that was possible? That's, that's one of these, I think, just blockades of imagination. He went out and tried it, and he's got, he's got some real insight, I think, into how that goes. Um, how does the organization yield anything like consciousness? Um, all right, first let me, let me address, I thought I had addressed it, I hadn't addressed it enough. Um, 
you get the sense, and you're not alone, a lot of people do, you've expressed it very well, that I start off talking about consciousness and then I do a little bait and switch and I talk about Zimbos. Yeah. Because, as I argue, we might just as well talk about Zimbos because Zimbos can do anything that a conscious person can do. So if we're going to have a science of consciousness, a science of consciousness, any way you cut it, is not going to be able to distinguish a Zimbo from a conscious person. It just isn't. Any, any, any theory that correctly describes a conscious person will also uh, model a Zimbo, sort of by definition. So let's, let's just solve the Zimbo problem first. Now the question is, if you do this, then of course Chalmers says, well, you've just left the hard problem out. And here's where I think he's fooling himself and a lot of other people too. And it's a, it's a sort of fallacy of uh, subtraction. Um, am I going to do this? Yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell you about the tuned deck. Um, I'm a very bad amateur card ma magician. And many years ago, I learned about a book I learned in a book of magic about a trick called the tuned deck. And uh, Hilliard writes about it in his book on greater card magic. He says, Clark Hull, a famous magician from Clarksburg, Ohio, has a trick he calls the tuned deck. And he's fooled professional ma magicians for years with this trick. Hull did this trick. He would do it dozens of times for them. They never could figure out how it was done. They tried to buy the trick from him. He wouldn't sell it. They tried to figure it out. They could never figure it out. This was a trick for his fellow magicians. And then later in his life, he wrote it up and he gave it to Hilliard, who published it in his book. That's how we know about it today. So the tuned deck. Here's how the trick goes. I'm, I don't have a deck of cards, and my hands are too clumsy now anyway. But it goes roughly like this. You get the general idea. Boys, I've got a new trick. It's called the tuned deck. I have this deck of cards. You listen to the vibrations. The vibrations are beautifully tuned so that I can, by hearing the vibrations, buzz, 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 I can pick up your card. Here, pick a card, any card. card is picked. Let's get put back into the deck. More buzz, buzz, and the card is produced. So he'd sit down, six magicians around in the circle, bright light, and he'd do the trick. And the magicians would huddle, and they would say, you know, He's awfully good, but look to me like it might, he might, I'm not going to tell you too much now. He might be doing a type A trick. Well, they know how to stop a type A trick. So they're obstreperous, uncooperative in just the way to prevent him from doing a type A trick, and he still does the trick. So they've disproved the hypothesis that it's a type A trick. So what could it be? Well, could it be a type B trick? Well, if we did this, then he couldn't do the trick. Let's try it. Again, he keeps doing the trick. No matter what they try, he can do the trick. So they decide he's really got something new they've never seen before. This is one mother of a trick. Okay, so how's the trick done? Like much good magic, the trick is over before you think it's even begun. The trick is in its entirety in the name of the trick the tuned deck. Remember I said at the beginning, he says, boys, I've got a new trick. It's called the tuned deck. The trick is now over. It's in fact in one of the words in the name of the trick. Which word? The. You're right. <laughs> he convinced them that he had a new trick. He would do a type A trick. They think it was a type A trick. They prevent him from doing a type A trick, so he'd do a type B trick. <laughs> he'd prevent him from doing a B trick, he'd do a type C trick. And by the time he's refuted it as a type D trick, he can go back and he can do a type A trick. What he realized, he could always do some trick or other, all of these tricks they knew. And they just couldn't keep track of this. That's why I said it's an error of subtraction. And bless him, Clark Hull says when he writes this up, the boys were all looking for something too hard. Now, I think that this is exactly what's going on with Chalmers and the hard problem. Chalmers is, in effect, saying, boys, I've got a new problem. It's called the hard problem. And now everybody talks about the hard problem as if 
he'd actually identified a problem. But it's not clear that he has identified a problem. And in fact, I say that it's just the other way around. What he calls the easy problems, which he's quite content to turn over to people like me and the cognitive neuroscientists, those are the hard problems, actually. And when we've got them all done, there won't be any hard problem left over. The only reason people think there's a hard problem is because people like Chalmers go around giving it the name, the hard problem, and convincing people that there's a difference between zombies and conscious people. But it is a very peculiar sort of difference because it is a difference that couldn't make a difference. If your wife were a zombie, she'd be just as lovable and intelligent and wonderful and just as articulate as if she were conscious. Come on, what kind of a property is that to hang anything on? The very idea that there is such a property, I think, is just a, a, an illusion. Okay. So if any uh, Zimbos would like to ask some questions, um, we can do it. Philosophers such as Ned Block and myself are not metaphysical dualists, but we think our notion of consciousness comes apart and that you may be right about one kind of consciousness, which, has, which is a cognitive notion, and lots of information processing may account for that, but that on the other hand, there's phenomenal consciousness, or as Ned now calls it, phenomenology, and uh, that, on the other hand, seems is something that you don't believe in. So that seems to be why people like, uh, people like Sean are unsatisfied, because you're taking that away from them while you may be right about taking away the other stuff. Maybe, as you and Wittgenstein think, there's no understanding, there's no experience but we're left unsatisfied because we think there's this other thing that is phenomenal experience. So could you, so that I think is where what's missing now. <coughs> lots about this before, but yeah. that's why some of us are left unsatisfied. Yeah. Well now, uh, as you know, Lynn, uh, I've responded easily three times, maybe four or five times, to Ned on phenomenal consciousness. And I think his distinction between phenomenal and access consciousness just doesn't work. Uh, so the, I don't think that there isn't phenomenal consciousness. I just think there isn't phenomenal consciousness as distinct from access consciousness. And I think that the idea of phenomenality, as he sometimes says, uh, in the absence of consciousness, is, uh, is a notion that one just doesn't make any sense. Um, Without going into a lengthy uh, exposition of what Ned means by those terms, I don't know if it's very, very uh, effective to discuss that here. Um, in, um, in one chapter in, in my book, Sweet Dreams, I, I, uh, I look at this in, in some depth by imagining uh, uh, an imaginary case that I call Mr. Clapgrass. Now, if you know about Capgras delusion, then you'll understand Mr. Clapgrass. One day, Mr. Clapgrass um, uh, wakes up and he just says, oh, life is awful. It's really bad. Uh, I don't want to go on living. This is terrible. And somebody gets the bright idea to point up at the sky and say, what color is that? He looks like it's blue. And the grass is green. Apple's red. They thought maybe he'd undergone spectrum inversion, that he'd had gone, undergone an inversion of his phenomenal qualities, right? The quality, at least. Um, but then it turns out that Mr. Clapgrass has made his living in recent years as a professional subject in, in a cognitive psychology lab. So he's been studied endlessly, and somebody gets the bright idea of taking out all the data they have on him, on his color preferences, and so forth. He's been studied, this is a, a, a color uh, laboratory, he's been studied for years, and so they know which colors 
make him nervous, which colors relax him, which colors he does better on cryptarithmetic problems when they're written in that ink, and so on and so on, and his preferences and all the rest of this. And they simply give him all those tests over again. And it turns out that all of that behavioral evidence is now inverted. When he looks at this guy, he says, yeah, that's blue. But he's responding to it the way he used to respond to yellow and so forth around the color wheel. So he's a behavioral spectrum inversion case. But as far as his ability to name colors, he's, he's normal. Now, have his, have his phenomenal qualities been inverted or not? If they've been inverted, then the phenomenal properties are captured within behavioral uh, 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 functional account, right? I mean, that's the problem. Hello. Hello. Hey, um, so my question actually, and I want to use the example of the, the most dangerous game, which is... Uh, oh, that story, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a short story where uh, there's a hunter and, and he's hunted all sorts of you know, crazy, wild, and dangerous animals from, from the savanna. And he eventually starts to hunt humans uh, because they, they, they are, he supposes, infinitely more dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I sort of f use that analogy because you talk about uh, computers and, and, and augmenting sort of the computer's abilities and how that competence can lead to comprehension. Mm -hmm. And yet, no matter how dangerous you make an animal, no matter how many, no matter how dangerous the tiger gets, I mean, you could, you could add laser beams to his eyes and have him shoot rockets and, and, and do so, all sorts of crazy stuff. He will never be as dangerous as a human being. And I think that that's a sort of comprehension that isn't captured by uh, simply scaling up competence and calling that increased comprehension. And I think another example would be if you had a, like, a, like a chess program, and, and, and now chess programs can defeat human, human players with relative ease. And yet, no matter how many programs you add to a chess program, let's say you, you, you give it a, 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 a sort of a, like a, a simulator to do language or a simulator to um, do all sorts of you know human tasks, it will never achieve the sort of competence that a human being has. In that a human being can simply go outside of the domain of all of these programs, can find something that the computer hasn't been programmed to do yet, and simply defeat it there, right? And that the reason why the human was eventually able to defeat the hunter in the most dangerous game was because it was able to metaphorically and uh, analytically deduce, you know, to, 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 to fight the hunter on its own terms. And that, and that comprehension on, in, in that sense needs to have that sort of component, needs to have uh, <coughs> that, that, like, that algorithm, that level of yeah. understanding okay, I, in order I to... Think I, get, I think I get your point, and actually I think I agree with you. Because I, although I've said a little bit about the architecture for a Zimbo, for, for consciousness, I haven't yet talked about, um, and I've said why it would come to exist, why it would evolve, in order to permit uh, uh, conversation, for instance. I haven't talked about what that gives us access to. That's tomorrow. Because that's what really, like, what explodes our comprehension. Our comprehension vastly orders of magnitude greater than the comprehension of a chimpanzee on just about any topic you can imagine. But it's not because we've got bigger brains, it's because we've packed our brains with thinking tools. And it's those thinking tools that really transform us. That's what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. So I think I, 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 think I in, in some regards, agree with you. Although I think that the, your example of the chess program, uh, indeed, if all we do is add uh, its capacity to talk about w the chess moves it's made, although that would be already a huge thing to add to it, uh, until it has the capacity to reflect on whether it might want to lose this game because this is a young player whose confidence needs a boost, uh, for instance, 
But by the time we've added that and added it for real, we've got a we've got a up and about person, not just a not just a bedridden computer player, uh, a chess player. So I think that your your imagined extension is a good idea, and I don't think the conclusion you draw from it, however, is correct. Namely, that no matter how much we added, we would never get to something that was like a person. I think we would eventually. Um, hello. So, uh, it seems that you could. Uh, it seems to me that you could give up all the qualia uh, intuitions and still think that there's something not yet adequate about the the functional organization answer. Um, namely, that you know what exactly is it that's different between the chimps functional organization and our functional organization? And you said something about how it could be something as little as a, a change in the gene. That could make the difference, but but that seems so far just to be a, you know, a dar, or dar, say the analog of a Darwinian explanation that that gives us the diachronic or causal history versus that it still hasn't given us the analog of the Turing um, account of just what is what are what are these function these organizational yeah. properties? Well, you're, you're right. I have I haven't said enough about that. Um, I will try to say some more about that tomorrow. Uh, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're right that uh, so far I haven't really begun to describe, as it were, the glories of the architecture that evolves to permit us to, uh, uh, to communicate the way we do and how it changes the way our minds work. That's really for tomorrow. There's a question down here at the front. Uh, Mark from Chuck Taylor. Well, I really appreciate the talk, and I found some stuff I very much agree with. Is this thing on? It's on. Yeah. Yep. What you said about talking to yourself is a derivative, really, from learning to talk to each other and yep, communicate yep, yep. in the role of language. So, in the light of all that, why the brain? That is, why just the brain? We're looking for materialism. This is material. This is material, right? Why just the brain? Oh no, not just the, the brain. The, the hands and the tongue and the and, and the head too. Uh, I, I I am a a, a mild extended mind fan. I mean that's all the rage these days. Uh, Alva uh, tomorrow down the road will will give a more radical version of this. Um, he is, after all, my my former postdoc. So uh, no, I'm I'm on board with the importance of all the external gear, and and even even with the idea, which is also comes out beautifully in Hofstadter's book, that our friends and loved ones uh, are not outside our minds uh, in in some important regards. So you're right, and it's still materialism. It's just recognizing that the functional boundaries that matter are not, the skin isn't that important as a boundary. So I think I agree with you. I'm going to take one opportunity to ask a question because it's been burning, burning me for two days now. Um, so <laughs> Selfish Neurons comes back today. Um, I, I spoke to you about this a little bit yesterday, but I just want to draw it out a little more. <coughs> when this notions of selfish genes were invoked, in the <coughs> Hamilton days, in the 60s and the 70s, and <coughs> capitalized by Richard in his book, The Selfish Gene, it was designed to solve a very particular problem that Darwin couldn't solve, which is the problem of altruism, mm -hmm. right? And it did a great job with helping to solve that problem, right? Um, and not only did it solve that problem, but it led to an extraordinary revolution yeah, in, the, yeah. in the predictive power of what we should be looking for in animals, humans yeah, included. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm still not getting even today is what the selfish neuron view solves as a problem <coughs> rather than it being a description that maybe there's competition for forming yeah, synapses yeah. and for forming heavy and connections yeah. and all yeah. the rest. What, so two yeah. questions. What is the problem it's solving and what would be at least one example of, an, of a prediction of what you, know, where you should be looking that you haven't yet? Yeah, good. Um, Oh, I wish 
that I had uh, a, an answer to put up there next to Hamilton and, and Dawkins and say, look, this is the problem and this is how it's solved. But I don't think it's actually like that. Um, the main reason that I'm pushing that idea is that I finally, finally, after sort of many years of just incomprehension, began to understand why there were so many people that had their face set so hard against artificial intelligence. Uh, right here in the front row, we have Bert Dreyfus, who uh, is the, 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 the veritable poet laureate of, of the, of the uh, uh, of principled skepticism about AI. When all along, it seemed to me that AI just obviously had to be, they may not have the right level, they might not have the right structures yet, but it just had to be true. That is, that Turing's, Turing was just right, he had to be right, that we had to be able to build from the modest base of computation and that the, a computational mind, of course the, uh, the mind is going to be a computer. Now, then, what, what are people correctly seeing when they turn their back on the AI that they see? One thing that had not really occurred to me before is they are, they, the, even though it wasn't being articulated as such, they are reacting with disbelief to the, to the Politburo organization of AI programs, to this hyper-efficient, uh, hyper uh, uh, structured program, they were thinking, that doesn't seem like the brain. And they're right. The brain isn't like that. But rather than that being a reason for thinking, well, so the brain isn't a computer and AI was on the wrong track, we should instead use it to think, oh, okay, um, AI should start taking deeply competitive models more seriously. Notice it's simply Another chapter in the history, you know, AI starts with sort of good old-fashioned AI, <clears throat> and then we, people realize that the brain just isn't like a von Neumann machine, and so they want to enlarge the bottleneck, they want to go to parallel processing, and then we have connectionism and so forth, and these are all gestures in the direction of making a more biologically realistic computational picture. And this is just the next wave of that. I want to say even, even connectionism is not, doesn't have the competitive element which I think would be useful. I think they should, I think you see we took a wrong turn with the McCulloch-Pitts logical neuron. And that that's, that's all I'm up to here, really. could explain the difference, if there is any, between um, between sort of software and machines? Because you seem to sort of say that computation is the same thing as having a machine, but it seems that one deals with sort of unitless abstract information, and the other thing deals always deals with things, always deals with things that have units. So like when a neuron communicates, it's not just transmitting information, it's moving stuff around. And when you have a machine that can actually implement it, something that you can actually have control over the physical world. It's always moving something. It's not just a software program. <coughs> well, you can't, you can't implement software without moving stuff around. It's just that the stuff you're moving around are electrons. Um, but, I mean, those are moving parts, really. So, uh, implemented running software is, is, is a, ultimately, in a certain sense, a mechanical device. I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow, because I'm, uh, to give you a little preview, uh, I'm going to be talking about words as, and the comparison between words and Java applets. Uh, Java applets are wonderful things. They're designed by software designers, and they instantly add a little functionality to your laptop, and you don't even see them. They're just these wonderful things. They have a lot of structure that's invisible to the user. Words are like that. I'm going to push that analogy. And, uh, but of course, a word can't enter your mind and your brain and, and get lodged there without making a physical difference. What kind of physical difference? 
Well, nothing that is nicely located. It's not as if it, it, it's these three dendrite branches here and this one here. No, it's, it's nothing. I don't think it's going to be anything like that. It's going to be very distributed, but we're going to need these software levels to describe what happens when you add a word to your vocabulary, for instance. It's physical, but don't try to... <coughs> you don't really want to think about a Java applet as a physical thing either. It's, it's an informational thing. So uh, please put your selfish neurons to sleep and join me in thanking Dan Dennett. Thank you. <laughs>